Okay, welcome everybody. Tonight we're talking picks for the Wanamaker, the highlight of the Milrose Games. It's a classic foot race taking place in New York City's The Armory, the 97th year of the race in the 115-year-old meet. The men's race will feature defending champ Ollie Hoare, Cole Hawker, New American 3,000-meter record holder Yard Nagus, among others. Women's race, Laura Muir ranked third in the world in 2022, reigning U.S. 1,500-meter champion Sinclair Johnson. Last year's runner-up, Josette Norris. There's, there's too many headliners to go over here, too. We're going we're gonna to get into it a little later. But uh, tonight, we welcome to the program Shannon Robery and Will Lear. Welcome. Sup. Shan Shannon was a, uh, a 2016 Wanamaker Mile champion, and Will... A 2014 Wanamaker Mile champion. So both have some keen insights in what it takes to win in the armory. The race was in the armory when you both yeah. won, right? For me, at least. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately. It, oh, you wanted oh. MSG. I mean, that's where the history is, you know? It's like there's like the there's like the Milrose games and there's like the new Milrose games. So yeah. Shannon and I are both new Milrose Games champion. Like the fact that Bernard Lagat ran like 353 in the garden yeah. is just dumb. Insane. Yeah. 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 How would those I think stems I did handle Mil a left track? Yeah. I think I did Milrose in the garden. I think I was, you know, a distant back somewhere. The fact that, as Will said, Bernard, I remember watching him in some of these races, like in, in the garden, just. Like the the ease with which he would leverage the turn to his advantage and come off just in time. I mean, that was a tricky track. Very impressive. Well, watching those on TV, it was always like it was always a tight pack, and then all of a sudden, like blown open, so that you had or somebody had like a full stretch lead, which was probably only twenty five meters anyway. But yeah, it looked like a giant gap. <laughs> Uh, That's the beauty of indoors. Those gaps seem insurmountable until they're not. Yeah, those turns can get pretty tough to start rolling. Let's see. I'll dig into a little bit of history here before we get started. Um, the first Wanamaker Mile was in 1926. became the top build event at the Milrose Games, taking the place of the one and a half mile. I didn't know that. For 10 years, the one and a half mile was the premier event. Uh, the Wanamaker Mile is named for a Wanamaker department owners or department store owner Rodman Wanamaker, whose employee started the Milrose Games in 1908. The first women's race took place in 1982, a bit later than I would have liked, but we got there. Uh, from 1914 to 2011, the Milrose Games were held, like we said, in Madison Square Garden on an 11 lap to a mile woodboard track. For a long time, the Wanamaker Mile was run at 10 p.m. to be showed on the nightly news in New York City, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, we should get back to that, I think. But now it's on NBC <laughs> uh, anyway, so you can see it. Uh, Are the you race sure it's on Peacock out? this year? It might be. No, it's on NBC. <laughs> but you could probably find it on Peacock, too. The race was known for its pageantry with the lights dimming in MSG as introductions to the races were made and the spotlights shone on them jogging around the track. Always so cool. In 2012, it moved to the historic Armory Building, which successfully holds on to the historic feel of the Milrose Games and stature of the Wanamaker Mile. That's one of the most prestigious non-championship foot races to win in the world. So, with all that in mind... I feel like you're just blowing some smoke there. Am I? Well, what are, I mean, what are the other ones? What are you ranking? The, the, the Bowerman Mile? The That's Dream a, Mile? A, the, the Crystal the, Palace? Yeah, the, the Grand Blue Mile at Drake. I don't know. The Lodi Mile? <laughs> the Lodi Mile? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's, there's many okay. other prestigious races. All miles, mind you. All miles. This one is is ninety. Milk Mile is a very fun indoor race to be doing, and I personally am excited. I was excited that it was at the Armory. I I agree with Will about the history, but from a quality and caliber, I felt like by the end of it, you're by the end of the uh, 
uh, Madison Square Garden days, there were people that were opting out simply because it was like not likely to be fast or, you know, getting it at the armory was an opportunity for them to not only be in a competitive field, but run fast. So if it's an exciting indoor race. Yeah. Well, let's, what is it like to win this race? Let's, let's start with you, Shannon. What's it like to win this race in the armory? Such a historic venue with like, uh, the stands are up high and people just shouting down at you on the track, waving their arms over the banisters. <laughs> You know, let's talk about the actual atmosphere as an athlete. It's kind of it's interesting, this you know, multi-story building that you're competing in, and the track itself is kind of cushioned in the center of it. Um, the warm-up, you know, I think each athlete sort of figures out what works for them, but you're usually out on the sidewalks of the neighborhood trying to get in some, some, um, some minute for the warm-up jog. And then when you get inside the building for the warm-up area, they have two long straightaways, maybe what, well, like a hundred meters or so. That oh, you, they're like, like three or four lanes like wide. They're very short. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> they seem forever yeah. because your depth of field is so narrow. You have walls and short True. ceilings, but yeah, right. no, they're dangerous. Yeah. So you're like trying to get a stride, but like as soon as you get up to speed, you're like, you're like. You look like one of those 60 meter sprinters. You only like bang into the wall, except you're a distance athlete with little like chicken wings. Um, but it's very unique. Uh, it's definitely memorable. The crowd is so passionate. And, you know, I really have to give it to New York Red Runners as well. Like their, their involvement when I was a part of it, you know, the quality of the event they put on. Ray Schwinn as the organizer, who was a uh, Mill Rose winner right himself so it's um the 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 energy that is really exciting and anytime you're racing in your city there's such um i mean that that whole entire city is just like tuned up a little higher um but it's really the track itself you know yeah as you said the fans are right up on you um and uh and so I think in indoor racing, what I always loved about indoor racing was just the intensity of the crowd. You could have a fraction of the people as outdoors, but because the noise just echoes, um, there's just this extra um, excitement when you're out competing. There's nothing like the thundering of the boards with the roar of the crowd. I think. <laughs> it's like a, you feel it in your chest. It's yeah. almost like, I mean, um, it's almost like spring training vibes where you're like in these intimate settings with like the true fan, right? It's not like, oh, I had nothing else to do this weekend. It's like, no, everyone who goes to the Millers games, especially has like been looking forward to going there for weeks, months. You know, they bought their tickets last year as they were walking out the door for the next iteration. And so I think like it's a heritage event, which is super, super cool. Cause I do, I do feel like we don't have a ton of those domestically in track and field. Um, and it's something, I mean, I know that my parents used to live in New York City and like they would go to the Milrose games when they lived there because it was like the thing to do and it's what all their friends did and because they all grew up doing it. And yeah, no, Shannon's exactly right. When you're in a, a venue where you're like literally being like shouted at from the rafters, um, it's it's unlike any other experience in track and field, truly. Um, I mean, you, you can race in the big European stadiums where there's like, you know, 80,000 people, but they're not that close to you. Like at, at any point in time, like, someone's spittle is coming out and like hitting you when you're in lane one on the track you know it's like <laughs> it's, it's, you can uh, touch them like you can touch the fan like, yeah you're walking out on this track and they're standing at the edge like you know where it's, it's a classic spot like at the first turn that people's you'll see depending on their height like some version of like this of their face <laughs> um which is it's so it's neat. got yeah it, it seems like it has this this well track racing at its highest level almost seems European to me because that's where the, the highest levels are, are, are racing. But it also has this feel of like an old American field house too. So it's a cool meeting mm -hmm. ground of that, that heritage of, of both, both styles. But uh, I agree. But, it's literally an armory, you know, that it housed. Yeah. <laughs> What's more American than that? Not, dare I say nothing. <laughs> All right, let's let's table that discussion uh, for now. That's for a later time. Yeah. Uh, so, what does it take to win 
this particular race, if you're if you're not looking at the field that's assembled this year, but just in in general uh, for what the Wanamaker Mile stands for and where it is in in the armory and um, where people are in their season, what does it take to win this race? I'll throw it out to anybody who wants it. I'll I'll jump in first, I guess. I think. Um... We've had instances lately where they bring in a like a highlighted athlete to go after some sort of record, which makes the race a whole lot less interesting than when it's a field of like relatively evenly matched athletes and a pace that isn't suicidal for this time of the year. It's like it's easy to think that when an athlete steps on the track that they're ready to go lights out. But the reality is a lot of these athletes, especially this year, when you're looking to championships that are much later in the summer. Budapest being late August, the Diamond League final in late September, um, going to be at the pre classic. So, like, that's that's the meat and potatoes of the season. This is like this is preseason. Um, I think one of the beauties of of these races is it's an opportunity for people to get serious, but not too serious. You know, like you're really level setting your expectations of where, you, how well your training has gone. You know, like some people are like, oh, my training has been spectacular, and then you go to race, and you race like crap, and it's like, well. Either it's between the ears or like maybe training wasn't as good as I thought that it was. Um, so what does it take to win this race? I think that it takes uh, having a productive fall, you know, coming off from a season, hopefully not injured um, or being fully rehabbed from a, a preseason's injury. It takes a lot of, I mean, I, I'll speak personally, a lot of luck. Um, and, and just like embracing what indoor racing is, you know, like you gotta be willing to throw some bows um, you gotta be willing to get dirty and like cut people off, you know, bob and weave in and out. You know, they, the beauty of the Wanamaker Mile is that it's like a lot of guys who are very evenly matched and you, there is so much traffic. You're not going to see, rarely do you see a Wanamaker Mile that just fully strings out. I mean, I remember one of, I think Shannon, the year that you won, did you run 420 that year? Yeah. Yeah. That was the year that people thought that I had like pulled my hamstring because I tied up so bad the last 50 minutes. Yes. You were at a full running. lactic bath. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was epic though, but it's like, you know, she was so far in front <laughs> that it's like, she was one race. And then there was like the, the, the has the other runners. Right. Um, and so I think like, that's where this race does get a little bit interesting because sometimes you have people that just like, uh, screw it. I'm going to go with whatever the pace is going to be. 210 is like, that's really fast. I mean, at Mil or at New Balance last weekend, they came through and Corey came through in 211. And they ended up running 423. So they, they stayed on the gas pretty well. Um, but Shannon, I don't, I mean, I, you can talk about your race. I don't know where you came through 800 in. I mean, I know that it was, it was fast. I think it was maybe around then I had run that season in 2016. I think I had deprived myself running low 420s at like the JDL flat track 200 meter race. And, um, and maybe I'm confusing my season a long time ago, but like I remember going after it getting out um, and like kind of biting off a bit more than I was ready for at that time of the year. Hence why I paid price. I think I was trying to go for either, you know, sub 420 or a meet record or something to that effect. Um, but it's always this interesting exploratory period, as you said, Will, at the, in this indoor season, right? So we had six to seven months until um, world champs, diamond league final. That's a long time. So you have athletes who approach that year differently they some might be saying i want a full indoor season and i really get after it and that's my way to be successful and then i'm gonna take a full break and then build up again and there's others that have had a long um you know maybe they competed more in the fall and they're using the winter as more base training and they're just trying to do a check-in so it's really hard to tell i mean we've had some races so you can get a sense of people's fitness but like we have maybe one to two races um for these people so there's like not a lot of data for us and really not a lot for them right like you go into this race even as an athlete like i know for me like that the Milrose that i won um feeling like okay i'm in good shape like let me try to get after it with the pacer um but I had a lot more strength than I had sharpness. And so, you know, that when I hit that lactic threshold, like I felt like it went from zero to 60 like that, you know, later in the year, maybe you have a little more play. Um, so, so it'll be interesting, you know, 
I think I'm looking at the field. I'm looking at the athletes kind of um, like history of work and like the caliber of the athlete, but like there can always be a wild card because there might be someone who's like, this is my world champ. Like I may not make it later. I'm, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case, but I have seen that in indoors. I've seen that at road mile championships where there's someone who has peaked for that race when other athletes who are, um, you know, maybe peaking for something else. Well, speaking of that, um, based on the new, the new world ranking system and what the, the points now mean, um, and the standards being so, um, well, being cut, cut down so low to be, to be so fast, uh, a lot of people are, are counting on, uh, world ranking to get them into these, these championships. So there are, there are actually major implications in this, in this race here and a, a serious opportunity to gain those points. Uh, this is a World Athletics Gold Label meeting, so 140 points are added to your results score uh, for the win. So, for example, Ali Hoar last year, he ran 350 to win the Wanamaker Mile, which is 1,251 uh, points. That time equals that. Add on 140, that gives him 1,391 points, and that became his third uh, ranked highest performance of the year. So... He's ranked fifth in the world last year, and uh, they take top five performances out of the year. This was number three, so it really did a lot to boost his his world ranking there. And now, as we as we venture into this new landscape, races throughout the year can have a little bit more meaning, and this is definitely one of those here. Somebody could hit a big one here and then go dark for a while, even. And yeah, so this is this. Milrose is part of the, and, and New Balance was as well. I think New Balance was a silver meet, um, but a part of the Journey to Gold series where USATF has stepped up and tried to create these opportunities domestically for athletes so that we have opportunities to go after those bonus points and you don't have to chase diamond leagues all over Europe. You know, you can just do it in your backyard or, you know, just across a couple of states in, in New York. So I think this is an incredible opportunity. You look at the, the entry list for us, for, I mean, on the men's side, heavily dominant by, um, by Americans. So again, great opportunities for them to, to crush in some rankings points. You know that these races, I mean, like the Wanamaker mile now is never going to be a 356 race. You know, it's like, it's going to be that low 350s. Um, and then you, you tack on those, those bonus points and yeah, like show up, you know, but I think Shannon made a really interesting point that you do indoors is a time where you do have people who are like, yeah, I'm just going to put all my eggs in this basket to try and establish myself and show meet directors, show, you know, anybody that's paying attention that like, that I'm, that I'm a formidable athlete and that I deserve start lines that maybe like you know, immediate post collegiate and you weren't an NCAA champion. And so like getting that start, well, if you do well, it's something like the Wanamaker mile or us indoors, like you can start to get some attention and get some momentum rolling there. And th this has become a very visible race being broadcast on NBC. And there were, there were times throughout the early two thousands where it wasn't on, um, on TV broadcast everywhere. So this is something that we saw last year where athletes made statements here that, um, that carried through the year. But, uh, yeah, one of those being Ollie Hoare, like we said, and then L L St. Pierre won the women's race four nineteen three. She won't be defending this year because she's excited. But before for the year before six, four sixteen, right. like, I feel like that was really her, like, kind of i mean we all knew who she was but like that was really her moment of like whoa at least for me as an athlete following the sport when she ran that like that was no that was no joke that's a really good bar um and you know she just yeah, kept that going that this was yeah. this was her coming out party pretty much um mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so there is the opportunity for that to happen at this race but let's uh i mean we've set it up enough let's just start talking about these races already so let's start out with the women's field here I'll list off the contenders. Uh, we've got Laura Muir, Sinclair Johnson, Gemma Riki, Josette Norris, Sage Herda Klecker, Nikki Hiltz, Medina Issa, Allie Wilson, Lucia Stafford, Cynthia Yahoo Vissa, Marta Penn Freitas, and Helen Schlachtenhofen. And we've heard that it's supposed to go out of 210 through the 800. So it uh, could be a little spicy out there. Uh, but let's get into this. And Shannon, who are the major players on this list in your mind? I mean, I I feel like Laura Muir just 
has to be the what most people have have their eyes on if I was going into this race to compete, given her the legacy of performances and her personal best. Um, she ran 414 on the roads uh, at New York Fifth Avenue Mile. This is her first time doing Milrose. Um, she would be the person that I would be looking to the most. So she was my first pick. Um, I think what I've what I've experienced with racing Laura is, and what I think is the most impressive about her is she is she's never fearful of just going after it. I love that she will put herself in it with the pacer and grind it out. Um, and, you know, if the fitness is there, she'll just push it that much further over the last, you know, 600 meters. Um, I think the only, the only thing I would think that could potentially be going against her is that it, she did a 3k, which was great, but she hasn't in, as we've seen, done a mile. So, you know, there's that question mark you're talking about before of, you know, where exactly is that sharpness over the shorter distance? Um, but she would definitely be my first pick. Um, obviously, soft spot for Sinclair Johnson, um, part of the Nike Union Athletics Club, but watched her at Lilac and just moved so effortlessly. You know, when she decided that she was going to take the lead, it was, you know, two steps. She was in front and then dominating the race. Um, and she has great foot speed as well. So I would say that those would be my top two picks for the, um, you know, for the race. Yeah, race I think winning. So spot. <laughs> we were kind of talking about this uh, last week, but there's a in cycling. Uh, there's this idea of the capo of the race, like the head of the race, and and they kind of dictate um, what the rest of the field does. Everybody keys off of the capo there, and it was. Lance, obviously, um, Bernardi, no, famously the Badger in the Tour de France. Um, so if Laura Muir is the capo here and everybody's keying off of her, what can anybody do to either counter her or, or compete with her or, or change the plan a little bit? Is there anything anybody can do or do they try to beat her at her own game? I mean, the, the, time i was able to beat her in the diamond league final um she did we had a, uh it got out at a great pace i basically glued myself to her and um was able to get by her the last you know coming off the turn and we battled it out over the last hundred meters leaned across the line fell across the line i ended up with the win um but i mean i love her as a competitor i love rooting for her because she gives it everything uh she's a great person and yeah i mean i think it's gonna be i could see it being laura Muir getting out on the pace or st Clair johnson gluing herself to her and trying and hoping that she has the speed over the last lap of the track to get by her um of course with indoor racing you know you have to time your kick differently um, because you have the the banks of the turn that can you'll know, make it tough to to pass, um, and so I think over that last four to six hundred meters, um, probably four hundred meters, if Sinclair is going to try to go, then she's going to try to see if she can find that opportunity um, to to get by her. But to me, that would be the interesting battle is Laura will probably do the work and Sinclair will probably hope that she can have more speed at the end to get by her. If we're assuming their fitness. Well, what do you think? I had to come off mute there. I, uh, I didn't want to, I don't want to make like my breathing or my, my size, but ah, to, to interrupt Shannon. So, <laughs> um, I have a little bit of a different take on, on this race and I, men's and women's racing completely different, uh, if I were to project my own experience onto the women's race, I'd say a 3K at Boston or at New Balance a week out from Melrose is exactly the recipe for success because that's what I did. Um, but beyond beyond my own personal experience, um, I I mean, maybe this isn't a very popular take. I wasn't super impressed with Laura Mir at New Balance. Um, you know, 840 is a good time for 3K, but I think she's run like sub 820 outdoors. So it's, I mean, you're talking different ball games there. I know that it's, it's, a, it's a hard travel over from the UK. I don't know if she's been training here domestically. 
Um, but there was a definitive lack of sharpness and she almost got pipped at the line. Um, and I'm trying to remember the woman's name who came in second, Melissa, Courtney Bryant, who came in second. I mean, like no. hot on her heels. If it was a 3,020 meter race, I think Melissa takes her down the last couple of strides. So that wasn't super encouraging for me. Obviously, 840 shows that she has good baseline fitness and then it comes down to the tactics of the race. So 210 out the gate is going to be, if that's true, if that ends up happening with, again, it, who is the female, like where's the female Eric Sawinski right now? Like we got to get some woman who can just like step up and and be as reliable as all these women need because I feel like they shuffle through rabbits and so there's no confidence in, in someone going out in 62 when they need to go out in 65. So I think that's a, that's another, again, we can, we'll table that conversation for a later date. But um, my my top. But it does impact the race, the confidence in the way that people would go and approach it. Absolutely. You're very right Absolutely. there. But I think that when I saw Sinclair at the Lilac, Grand Prix that she just looked incredible. I mean, just in control, powerful. And you love to see she didn't get stressed super hard in her effort. Um, so there are those question marks there, like what kind of fitness is she in? But she's just such a savvy racer and she's really finding herself of being like trying to establish as being, you know, one of the best in the world. And so again, great opportunities for her to take down someone like Laura Mir and that she can come back to that later in the season when they race in the Diamond Leagues. Um, and I think Nikki Hiltz is going to surprise and come up as the runner up. Nikki ran fourth. We were just talking about this in the mm. pre-show ran 432, um, in Flagstaff, which is, I, can we use expletives in this? Yeah, fucking fine. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> like it's running in, in the dome there in the sky dome is it's incredibly difficult. I mean, on this, on the wall and there's, it's like, catch your breath. You're at 7,000 feet. Um, so running a mile on 432 there, which would have placed Nikki in the top eight at, at New Balance, um, you know, 7,000 feet higher. I, I think that Nikki's going to come down and, and they're a savvy racer. Like Nikki's a little bit smaller than the women that she races against, some of the women that she races against. Um, and as a result, I think that it, it is that the fact that if any indoors when you need to sort of like move in and out and, and. And they also have good 800 meter speed, good leg turnover. So like making those moves on a short straightaway is a little bit easier. Um, and so I think Nikki's going to come up in second. And I have Laura Mir holding on for that third spot um, because it's Laura Mir. And, and I can't say that she's not going to finish out of the top three. Yeah, I think. So you think Laura's going to take it with the pacer that Sinclair and Nikki will fit? Or Nikki will sit, someone will sit, and then basically get picked at the line. But hold on. Laura will I think what third. will end up happening. Yeah, <laughs> I think what third. will end up happening. Is, and, <laughs> and again, I think Nikki's perform, runner-up performance, it will only happen if there isn't a gap. And I see that being <laughs> something that could, that could tend to separate um, two fields in this race. So if someone is positioned right behind, I think Laura goes at the pace. I think Sinclair is right right on her hot on her heels and whoever gets right behind Sinclair, if they let a gap, like an insurmountable gap open up, then it's like everyone's racing for third versus, you know, the battle that's going on up front. Um, obviously, right. You know, when someone's dying a terrible death indoors, a lot of ground can be made up, but, um, you know, hopefully the, the, the pack is strong. The Peloton is strong, even though the capo is out there just, uh, you know, hammering away. But, um, but yeah, that's, I, you know, I have, I, I can go through my top five on the women's side. I have. Well, we're not. Gonna, I have. We're not going to give them yet. Like we're. Oh, we're not going to give. Them. Okay. Well, okay. Well, then I'll, I'll stop oh. there. We're almost there. Right. Okay. I'll I'll moderate this thing. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I was going to add it myself. <laughs> Jeff's got to give his opinion. Yeah. Will. We got to let him talk. Yeah, please. <laughs> I agree with you on on Nikki though. Um, I think if we're looking at who's trending at this point, uh, Nikki had kind of a slow start to last season, but they really ramped up towards the end and 421 win at sir walter and then uh second place fifth Ave 417 and now we know that they're fit because of 432 and flagstaff so that's that's a good line others might might have like taken some time to recover in the off season but um who knows maybe this is a maybe this is continuous from from 2022 and we could see just a steady build but also names 
Oh, Will, you wanted to say something. You wanted to jump in. Well, I was just going to say that I love the self-deprecating nature of Nikki's post after the mile and Flagstaff because it's like, you know, what is a conversion? It, it's different for everybody. But I think that by virtue of acknowledging it, of saying like, you know, 432, nothing that I really would normally tout from the mountaintops as being this incredible performance. But I think it's showing that Nikki is enjoying the training environment that they have there, that they are happy and like the posts of like of how how they're taking sort of taking the piss, if you will, of like, yeah, we're in 432 and there's like a 30 second conversion. I feel like that's indicative of someone who's enjoying the process and is looking forward to enjoying some some mm -hmm. good indoor racing. Yeah. And I, I am interested, um I am interested in the on athletics club here too, because I know that they kind of circle this this meet and they did last year to really make a statement and uh definitely in in uh, the mile and the 3k with with beamish taking that too so uh sage herta klecker is in here and she recently ran 236 in the k and and josette norris just joined the oac so i don't i don't really know what the timeline is there how long she has been training with dathan but if this is a meet uh kind of the the pinnacle of the indoor season here I would expect them to to come out gun blazing in this thing and be ready for a for a show. So there's there are those names, and then also Lucia Stafford too, two thirty three in the K, uh, two weeks ago, and then and then a, a great mile too, runner up in at New Balance. So that's a lot of racing right, for indoors. But when you're on a roll, you're on a roll. I guess you guys would know better than me. Keep it going. Um. All right. Well, that was it. Well, and yeah, and Canada qualified differently too. So, you know. What's that? Yeah, at least Canada has like different qualifying than the U.S. would have. So, you know, everybody different strokes yeah. for different folks. Also, winter is longer in Canada, so their indoor season is more substantial. Very true. I don't know if you knew yeah. that. Winter goes to June. At yeah, least. indoor track. Yeah, indoor track starts in August. I think Canada Day is the first day of summer or spring, at least. That's and what's that? July. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I, I think I think this is gonna be a fast race. I think uh Laura Mira doesn't mess around. Um well you're 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 trying to I, I, I hear what you're saying and uh and I'm influenced by your by your opinions, but I'm not gonna change my picks now. So minor. Uh I think it's gonna be Laura Mir taking it first. I've got Sinclair Johnson second, uh, Nikki Hiltz in third. And Josette Norris and Sage Herder Klecker. So OAC comes up for the fourth and fifth places there. Will, what do you have? Well, I was going to say that um, per the rankings points that are being put up on on Tracklandia's website, I think that's that's just, I assume that's what those numbers are to the right side. Um, yeah. yeah, I have I have Sinclair for the win. Nikki come in in second. Laura Muir fading to third. Sage heard a clutter coming in fourth and Lucia Stafford um, getting a little bit tired after the week, the multiple weeks of racing. All right. Shannon. I, you and I are seeing eye to eye, Jeff. So we'll see how well we predicted it. But yes, I also had Laura Muir first, Sinclair Johnson. Second, Nikki Hill shows that Norris in fourth and Sage Herta Klecker in fifth. Same exact one. Oh, well, we're going to have to split that Taco Bell gift card if we win, I guess. Did you guys, did, oh, did, I mean, do you guys have information on that? I didn't see a time from Josette in the mile in Boulder. You know, maybe I'm missing something here. It's in my backyard. I should have just walked over there and watched. Yeah. We're, I'm Dayton going to give you the I mean, you make a great point, Will. There's a big, yeah, there's a big question mark because change, there's always that change period and the adaptation to a new training environment. But um, as Jeff said, I think like her historical performance, um, especially you know, coming in third of the Diamond League final last year, um, had just a really phenomenal season, got buried, has, you know, really you know, looking ahead now to... 24 and uh, like some interesting and exciting momentum so and because the on team does seem to be really kind of as Jeff said circling around Mill Rose, uh, that as a 
focus. You could see it from the athlete posts, you know, because I was stalking them as I tried to think about what I would want to pick. But at, consistently across the board, there was this conversation about two weeks till Mill Roads, 10 days till Mill Roads, getting for Mill Roads, like really a focus and an emphasis, I think, for them. This is almost like they're in their camp. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, they're cool what again. they bring to the table. But, I, so yeah. 2022, a bit, bit of a, yeah. Yeah, keep feeding. Yeah, I, I guess Josette took a bit of a down year. 2022 wasn't as good as 2021, but 2021 was amazing. I, I ran a few of the numbers here. And for her 1,500 slash mile races in 2021, she batted 500 for wins. She won 50% of her races. And in the top three, 90% of the time. So... I mean, I like, I like those numbers there. If she can get, catch a little bit of that magic from two years ago, then she'll be up there. I like Josette. I think she's an incredible competitor. I love the summer of Josette was really fun to watch. Um, and you know, we, we all wished that she would have been a bit more formidable last year with the domestic world championships because, you know, our, but the way the world and women's 1500 meter running in America right now is like, it's just lights out. So. That's uh, yeah. So I know we're trying to back you into the corner to say something that you don't want to say about Jose. But we like everybody on the sheet here, so I won't. I won't. Not, it's not going to happen. He has made his picks and he is sticking to I them. Am. I, I am. Okay. Let's Absolutely. uh, let's move on. Let's move on to the men's race then. Let's dig into that a little bit. So I'll list the names out here. We've got Ollie Hoare, defending champ last year. Um, beat Josh Kerr there at an epic battle in the final 200. Cole Hawker is now in this one. He was in the 3K last year. Yara Nagus, the recent 3,000 meter American record holder. Uh, Mario Garcia Romo, Sam Tanner, Neil Gorley, who waged that epic battle at, at New Balance last week. Sam Prakol, Johnny Gregoric, Josh Thompson, Elliot Kipsang, Drew Hunter, and Eric Holt. So OAC is bringing out their big guns in this one. They're they're a heck of a, a fifteen hundred meter team now with some some real horses there. Uh, the defending champs coming back, but uh, Will is he the favorite? Is he the favorite? Sure. Yeah. Is he my pick to win? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Please. Yeah. Well, I mean, don't give us your pick right away. No, I, I think this is going to be a super interesting race. You know, we have less information about the men's race than we do the women's. So unsure of, you know, what Eric Swincy is going to be tasked at for going out through 800 or a K. I think ultimately that what's going to dictate this, this race <clears throat> and ultimately how it shakes out in terms of the final placings is if they have a rabbit that can go longer than a K. If you have a rabbit that can go longer than a K, I think that feeds right into the hands of someone like an Ollie. But Ollie is a front runner. He loves like being in control. He loves that capo position. Like he, he enjoys being in control. I mean, I'm, you know, very Matt Centrowitz in that way. Um, but Centro didn't really care how hard he had to run. He just liked being in the front. Um, watching Yard in Boston two weekends ago was, I mean, it was, it was beautiful. It was a thing of beauty. Um, so he's obviously fit. Being able to run 728 is incredible. Um, but also, I mean, I got to give props to my boy, Neil Gorley. He's maybe one of the most underrated of the British 1500 meter superstars. Um, guy ran 332 last summer and saved getting terribly boxed in in Boston in the last 50 meters and coming back. I mean, he came back probably five meters on Sam Tanner in the last 50. Um, to eke out the win, I think, you know, he's, he's tenacious. He's a good racer. He won a lot of the races that he ran last year because he was, again, in this position of trying to, to establish. And I think that he still is. Um, he often gets overshadowed by, obviously, Jake Whiteman. Um, but domestically here, Josh Kerr, because of the NCAA career Josh Kerr had. I think that we talk about that all the time. Or, you know, on the NBC broadcast, Paul Swingard can't talk about it enough. I went to New Mexico and touting the... the, the <laughs> the laurels of the NCAA, um, which is great, but you know, Neil had a, a different NCAA pass. Um, Sam Tanner also, I, I love Sam Tanner's reaction at the end of new balance last week when he just laughs when he gets pipped at the line. Ah, like I, I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that so much of an athlete that's like, 
rather than, you know, the, the feeling or the look of disappointment. It's just like, oh, that was really fun. We had a really fun so time. I, yeah, that was really great. I don't understand. When I stub my toe, I'm, I'm furious. But some people laugh when they do that. And I don't get that. It's, it's, the, it's a similar thing, I feel like. Um, but, you know, hometown hero Johnny G uh, in the house. And, and I think, like, he shows up at Melrose. You know, his family's there. Uh, he's comfortable there, spent so many years training there. And so I think that there's, there's a level of comfort that comes, um, with that. I very deep field. Uh, you know, you, I'd love to see one of these races where you can kind of throw a blanket over the finish of the top five, but I don't think that that's going to be this year. You think, do you think they're going to make it hot? I think it's going to be hot. I, I think it's going to go sub 350. Who is, and who's the cop of here? Who's the capo or who's the, who's the victor? Uh, no, who's, who's, who's the dictator? Who's making the, it doesn't matter if they win or not, but who's going to be driving yeah. this thing? I think Ollie drives it. I think that, um, you know, hearing through the Boulder grapevine, he's been incredible in training. Um, I just, what makes me nervous of a race like this is when you have a field of people who have been racing for some, versus someone who hasn't execute, had to execute in the race. Um, obviously doing a rabbiting job is like a dress rehearsal, but you don't have to lean into that finish or like really embrace the pain and the rabbiting job. You can step off, you know, if you're supposed to go 2,200 meters and you make it 2,190, that's like, you did a great job. But like, if you're supposed to run a mile and you only make it 1600 meters, you, know, you didn't get there, did you? So, um, yeah, I, th I think, I think Ollie will drive the train. I don't really see anyone else who uh, is going to embrace setting the pace in this, in this field. Um, and I think Ollie would probably be leaning into a strategy of go hard from the gun and, and try and break the field open. Um, but you're going to have a lot of athletes that are going to be hot on his heels. Obviously, you know, I, the OAC guys are going to know Dayton is going to have a strategy for them because for Dayton, the best possible result is an OAC blanket finish, right? One, two, three. Um, I think you're going to have a lot of guys that are, are going to try and break that up. Yeah. And what do you think? Well, I think it is your point about the OAC and a blanket finish makes me think about the confidence and value that might be coming from three strong competitors all coming from the same team and the way that they may or may not kind of work together to dictate the race and how it plays out. Um, I think you have a really great point, Will, about pacing versus actually racing. So it's a big question mark, um, Ollie coming into this, having paced the 5K and seeing his teammates run so well, but not actually finishing the race, race himself. I mean, if he's a competitor that we assume he is, then perhaps that's given him extra motivation to kind of come out for this and really, uh, you know, see what he can do. But but I would be interested. I, I would be interested to see if and how these three men, um, Ollie, Garrett, and Mario, work together um, to try to dictate how the race plays out. Um, and then, of course, there's Cole Hawker, who was in, who won in a very small field at Lilac, but um, but by a lot, and uh, and um, talked about beforehand how you know running a 3K prior to you know, running a successful mile is sort of his strategy and he felt really confident in his choice. So, um, you know, I think he's going to be coming in with his eyes set on the, on the, on the win if, if he can get it. Um, and then to Will's point with Neil having won the one last weekend, right? He won 352 um, on the second. So not long. Yes. Yeah. No? Right this yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like Yes. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the results. Yes. Um, as Will had said, you know, uh, over Sam Tanner, um, coming off a win already on the East coast. So I'd imagine he probably stayed over there, which that lack of having to travel versus, you know, not that a cross country flight will crush you and it's an evening race so you can get plenty of sleep, but you know, um, he's already over on that time zone, did well at it. And not many days later, going to be going after it again. What, what kind of race does this need to be for Cole Hawker to win it? Will. Cole Hawker's not in my top five. 
So what time? I mean, what? look, I mean, look, yeah. 750. I know look, the, again, I'm going to say some things here that are not going to be popular with some people who feel very strongly about them, but I don't have the experience. This is coming from athlete voices that are not my own, but the track in Spokane is pretty slow. It is no BU and 750 is that won't get you to NCAAs right now in the 3k. So it's not as though like running a 3k, I can go out and run 3k in 12 minutes, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be ready for a mile a week later. And so I, I don't think that he was under any stress last weekend other than like going through the motions of putting on his uniform. Um, and I, I, I got nothing from watching that race. I'm like, I have no idea what kind of shape, like he should be able to jog 750 on almost any day of the year. Um, if you know, at the caliber of athlete that he is. So again, I was, I was quite unimpressed with that. I also didn't really see him try. <laughs> like he dismantled that field with, with ease, but it's like, he didn't even put any stress on himself the last 600 to see like, all right, let me see if I can run 125 for this last 600 and like, you know, get something out of this. It was like, oh no, I'm just going to go win. So maybe he's so good that, you know, I hope that he, I put my foot in my mouth with this one, but um, per how, how well other people in this race are running right now, I don't, I don't see him in the top five. I can see like getting kind of pulled along and trying to hope that he has the kick that has served him so well. And then we will see, I think that's where the sharpness plays in. I think that's always the mystery of indoor season is the expectation of you reach for something that you're so used to having, but you're not always quite sure if it's there yet, or you maybe haven't done the work for it yet. And especially for, it's always interesting watching younger athletes as they mature, they develop new skills, but like some of the other ones that came so innately evolve and change too. Uh, so, you know, to, to, to I, I could, I think with three athletics athletes who are running strong, I could see the race being dictated to some degree by them. I could see Cole Pocker slipping in and trying to get pulled along. And then the challenge will be like, does he have the speed at the end that he Yeah. I think that's that's the question, Mark, is 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 that kick gonna show up when he needs it? Uh, because his first well, two years ago, he was so incredibly raw and you didn't know where that thing came from. It was just you're like, oh he He's just figuring out how to race and how to navigate fields, but he could depend on this, like this cannon launch that just catapulted him into the, the home straight. But, um, is that going to be around this time? So yeah, we'll see. He, he raced a lot, um, two years ago, but yeah, there are a lot of great, great guys in this field. And I think for my picks, um, I, again, I, I went and looked at their, how many times they placed in the top three and then how many times they, they won the races they competed in. There's a ton of data actually for this field. A lot of these guys have raced a lot. Like, like Will was saying, Neil Gorley, 13 times last year outdoors between the 15 and the mile. Um, and he was just outdoors, not right, counting indoors just outdoors. too. So oh, that's a lot. And he was batting 385 for top threes there, which is pretty good. Sam Tanner raced 13 times outdoors as well, between the 15 and the mile. He was bad in 583, so over 50% in the top three. Um, Ollie Hoare's pretty, pretty crazy, his numbers. Uh, 12 times he raced between 1,500 and the mile. Um, he batted 4, 416 in wins and was in the top three 83% of the time. So that's, that's pretty ridiculous there. Uh, Romo's another guy to look out for. And I mean, he raced an NCAA season. So 17 times. So that's a, a lot of data there, but Batten 82% in the, in the top three there. Um, and then Nagoose is, is also just, um, winning 78% of the time. So I, I know that he didn't make the, the world championships last year, but those are some some pretty crazy numbers. Yeah, he was he was eleventh at USA's actually in the slow race because it, it was one in three forty six and he ran three forty seven. So that'll tell you something too. He in a hot race, he does really well. Um, I mean, winning seventy eight percent of the time is 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 pretty astounding. But I think like like we've been talking about this whole time, this is a target on OAC's calendar. So they balled out last year. At the 
at the Melrose games and it's the most widely seen meet of the indoor season. I mean, even more than USA's probably and USA's not being um, a qualifying meet to anywhere else this year with no world indoors. This is, I think this is the big meet of the season. Uh, so they, they had their fun with times in, in Boston, but I think um, they want some names here in the Wanamaker mile and they want to make a statement. So um, I don't know if the same focus is being placed on this meet for Cole Hawker as it is for the OAC. Like maybe he's looking a little bit further down the road as, as Will was saying too, that, athletes are, are looking towards where their their bread is buttered outdoors but uh i'm gonna go here with uh Nagus taking the win and then ollie whore in second cole hawker gets third uh garcia romo in fourth and sam tanner fifth. so you got three oac guys in the top five but i think hawker does find that kick to mix it up and and come up for third place but i think that Nagus and Hor are going to be out there too far for him. Shannon, what do you think? Oh, so I, you, hearing both of you, I'm reconsidering all of my picks, but I will tell you what I picked because I'm going to own them. So I had Ollie in first, um, you know, just given the, the defending champ a little extra Extra love, Cool Hawker in number two, Finn Goose in second, third, uh, Neil Gorley in fourth, and Mario Garcia Romo in fifth. Um, same as you with three on athletics in the top five, but different ordering of them. Nice. Will? <sighs> we know who's not up there. This is going to be like completely different. <laughs> so I, I'm not completely different, but. I like if I had to actually put money on this, I would probably orient my picks differently. Come on, I I Are you would like to see. Truthful here? No, it's you know what do I want to have happen versus what do I think is going to happen, right? They, they, they are... And what are we hearing from you now? The want to have happen. This is a want. Thing? This is a want. Okay, and, and I'll tell you why. I want it to happen this way because I want the person that wins this race to be an American. I want the person that wins this race to use this to catapult a very successful outdoor campaign because I think the person that I want to win this race, I think could potentially be the future of the event in our country. And then that person is Yard Nagus. I, as much as I, I like watching Cole Hawker run because of... I mean, the shake and bake. I mean, it's, it's truly incredible. Um, I think that Yard has like 327 capabilities. And what we're seeing at all the championships now is like, not only do you have to be able to finish hard, but you got to be able to run sub 330 after three rounds. So I would love to see Yard win this race. I would love to see Neil come up in second. Um, I think that he's just, he's, he's on fire right now. He ran a 216 time trial K. Um, popping down from from Flagstaff to Phoenix a few weeks ago and just like, and followed it up with, you know, 352. It's messed up to say this when you're like, oh, it's all, it was only a 352 well, because you got, you know, high school freshmen out at UW running 351 for the mile. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't even have their driver's license yet, just running 351. Um, <laughs> but I, I think, I think Neil comes up closing hard to to pip ollie and i think that i think it'll be very close i think the race is going to be one under 350 i think that second place will probably be 350 oh or 350.1 um ollie's going to come in in third after having done the line share of the work for most of the race um sam tanner is going to be fourth following neil gorley because he's going to want to have beaten neil after neil beat him last weekend um so covering some of the same moves the strategic moves that neil makes weaving his way through the field over the last four or 500 meters and hometown hero Johnny G is coming in fifth place. The guy knows how to do it. I mean, he's the a jet. stalwart, the jet. <laughs> and he's going to do it in blue him. jeans. He's doing it in blue jeans. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I hope they, I hope they're at least cut offs this time. Air those babies out and it gets hot in the armory. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. That, that's my picks. I'm probably wrong. Hey, well, 
I like how you told it. It warms my heart. I would love for that to happen. Yeah. You've sold me. Yeah. And I was going to say, <laughs> well, that Neil Gorley uh, would take the British record, but I forgot that Josh Kerr ran 348 in Boston last year, but it was 352. So he could be second. Of all yeah. He's, the I think he's third. He's third on the list right now. Okay. 352. Nice. It's, yeah. and it's Kerr, Peter Elliott, and Gorley. He's got to take Peter Elliott down. Beautiful. Well, thank you both for, uh, for joining me here tonight. And um, everybody out there should make their picks too. You can make them at trackland.com. The winner gets a Tracklandia t shirt and a $25 gift card to Taco Bell. So make sure that you make all your picks. And enjoy some Taco Bell. If you do, if you do happen to win, um, Will, uh, Shannon, where are you going to be watching on Saturday? I'm in San Francisco currently, so me and my trusty nice. computer. <laughs> oh, you're on you, Will. Oh, he's muted. I remember my first Zoom call. <laughs> and I just had, I had such a good line there, and now I can't even say it again. I will be watching from the comforts of my own home, but... So usually for these races, I find my, I, I have to stand. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say from the comforts of my couch, yeah. but I'll be, yeah, like I, I get like, sweaty and it's not. Yeah. I'm like tingly. I like hard to watch yeah. races. Like it took me a bit to be able to watch races and not for, like have the same feelings when I was watching in them yeah. myself. I got to do arm exercises. Yeah. It helps like, do the wings and stuff and like stretch out a little bit. It just opens up the chest more, and I feel like that releases. The, the well, energy. maybe we'll fire up, fire up a group Facetime okay. during the during the miles. We'll, see how, we'll see how we do. <laughs> you know, <It'd> fun. <laughs> one more thing: who's winning the Super Bowl? Actually, that who's would be really Super Bowl? entertaining. Yeah. Oh. Neil Gorley, get get those get those wings out, big guy. Oh, the Eagles! Mm -hmm. See what you did. Nice. I got the Chiefs. Uh, well, I hope you both enjoy your Taco Bell if you do happen to win. Thanks for doing this. I'll see you around soon. All right. See you Bye, later. Guys. That's it, guys. <laughs>